But the next question we want to answer is what do we then do with these synchrotron spectral properties? Um, so how can we then get physical constraints on the radio emitting region and understand what that means for the TDE and things like that? So the thing that we need to think about in this context is what is actually driving the outflow. And this is rather hotly debated in the field still. Um, and I think the main reason it's so hotly debated is that we only have 20 or so good observations of radio TDEs. Um, so you can kind of, when you have such few, so few observations, you can fit any model that you like effectively to the population. Um, but there are a few different scenarios. So the first is that this radio emission is all being produced by jets, whether they are really relativistic, highly collimated vet jets, not vets, be nice if there were animals involved, um, or non-relativistic, um, like a sub-relativistic jet from the accretion onto the black hole, um, and this would be kind of less collimated, but still, you know, some kind of jet-like structure. Um, and we do know that black holes accreting tend to produce jets, whether or not we always observe them is, is under debate. The other thing that we could get is an accretion-induced wind. So we know that about half of the stellar debris accretes onto the black hole. Um, accretion is a relatively inefficient process usually. This does drive winds and that can eject material. This would produce more of a spherical outflow, so material would be ejected in all directions. It wouldn't necessarily be collimated. Um, but the other thing is that accretion is traced by X-ray observations usually. And so if this, the radio emission was being driven by an accretion-induced wind, we would expect to see some correlation between the radio um, behavior and the X-ray behavior of these systems. And at the moment, we just don't see that. Um, yeah. So the other scenario is that we could have a collision-induced outflow. Um, and so this is when the debris is circularizing, the streams collide. Perhaps you simulated this today in Phantom. Um, and this can drive outflow. So you've got all this, these streams colliding, those shocks and collisions can shoot particles out in all directions. So again, this would be a, you know, some kind of spherical-ish structure of material um, moving away from the system. Um, and this would be launched very early on. So pretty much as soon as the star is disrupted, the debris comes around, intersects with itself, um, and this can launch these outflows. So these would, would be very early launched outflows, whereas the accretion-induced wind or jet outflows should probably be a little bit delayed um, because there is some expected time for the debris to circularize and accretion to begin. Some people say it can happen immediately, others say you need a bit of time for the disk to form and accretion to begin. The other thing is that we have this unbound debris stream. So when the star is initially disrupted, it kind of becomes this really long stream, I guess. Perhaps you also saw this in your simulations. Um, and this unbound debris stream holds a lot of mass. Um, it would be launched early, it would, with the radio emission we see would correspond to the fastest unbound debris, um, but it tends to be a very narrow stream of material. So it would require a very narrow viewing angle. And at the moment, we get radio detections from about half of all TDEs. So that doesn't quite check out um, with it being a narrow viewing angle because we see radio emission is quite common. Um, but these two types of outflows are kind of debris-driven outflows and would be launched very early after the disruption, whereas the other two black hole accretion-driven outflows um, would be perhaps launched later and there should be perhaps a link to X-rays. But the other important thing to consider is that the, the debris of the star is not just being ejected out into a vacuum. It's being ejected out into a galaxy. And the central regions of the galaxy are, I guess, pretty dense. Um, there's probably some gas hanging around, depending on whether or not the black hole has been active in the past um, and, you know, all things about the galaxy itself. Um, and so that circumnuclear environment also affects the propagation of the outflow and will affect how long it takes for the outflow to decelerate, um, how energetic the shock is. So if it's a really dense subject nuclear environment, it drives a more energetic shock. You should see brighter radio emission um, and things like that. So it's not just the circumstances surrounding how the star was destroyed that affects the radio emission, but it's also the environment and the black hole um, and, the, and the galaxy. So the question is, how do we distinguish between these scenarios with the lovely radio observations that we have? So we need constraints on the outflow. 
um, and things like the velocity of the outflow, the mass in the outflow, the energy of the outflow and the geometry of the outflow would all give really key insights into what is actually driving these outflows that we see. If they're very collimated, if they're very fast, if they're slow, um, if there's a lot of mass in it, if there's only a little bit of mass, all those sorts of things would help us understand what is actually driving these outflows. Um, and also the multi evolution. So if there's x-rays, optical, UV, some correlation between the radio and those sorts of things. So how do we go from our radio spectra um, to, for example, a radius and an energy of the outflow? Um, and the most important thing is that a measurement of the synchrotron self-absorption flux and frequency provides very tight constraints on the physical size of the emitting region of that synchrotron source, and we can get a lower limit on its energy. So we have three observed constraints. The peak flux of our spectrum, so I'm gonna draw a spectrum here, I guess. Let's rub this up. Okay, so we have our peaked synchrotron spectrum. Something, well, it's usually not that peaked, but whatever. Um, <laughs> so that we measure this frequency, mu s a, we measure the flux, f p, and we measure this power law index, where it's one mu to the power of one minus p on two. So we measure p. So there are three constraints that we can measure just by observing, you know, our radio spectrum that looks something like that. Never that nice, but you know. Okay. But the emitting region is characterized by four unknowns. Um, so it's the number of electrons that radiate in the observed frequency, the Lorentz factor of those electrons, so that's the gamma, the magnetic field strength, so B, and the source radius or the area and the volume of the emitting region, so that's R. So at the moment we have three observed constraints but four unknowns. And so with what we have observed, we don't have enough constraints um, to fully characterize the system. So we need a fourth assumption, constraint, equation, whatever you want to call it. Um, and what we do in order to get this fourth constraint is that um, we, here it is, we use something called the equipartition method. And this equipartition method, method at the end of the day comes from the assumption or the condition that the source needs to be reasonable. Um, <laughs> and by that, um, the electron and the magnetic energy depend very sensitively on the radius or the size of the emitting region in opposite ways. So the total energy of the system is minimized at some radius in which the electrons and magnetic field are roughly in equipartition. So this is what we call the equipartition approach. So we assume equipartition that gives us the fourth equation that we need. And we can then constrain, we get a good constraint on the radius of the system and a good constraint on the minimum energy of the system. So it looks something like this. So if you have a given source with particle energy density um, and magnetic energy density, so U E and U B, the total energy density U um, has this fairly sharp minimum um, so this is a plot of those two things. Um, and we can solve for that minimum. And so you to solve for the minimum of a function, you take the derivative du on db, you set that to zero. If you do all of those things, you end up with this constraint that the, there's a relation between the energy in the magnetic field and the energy in the electrons. And this is the equipartition equation that we then use um, to constrain the system. Pardon? Eta. Yeah, so eta is the ion over the electron energy ratio. Over the electron energy ratio. Um, so yeah, I can point you towards a textbook that actually derives, well, lecture notes, textbook, something online, a PDF, um, that goes through this equipartition derivation if you're interested. Um, just let me know, because it's quite a, 
simple argument, I guess, um, but it provides a really nice constraint on these synchrotron emitting sources. And that the key here is that this is because we've absorbed the synchrotron self-absorption break. But actually, if you observe the synchrotron self-absorption break, the minimum break, and the cooling break, so all three characteristic break frequencies, you actually have enough constraints to constrain the system without assuming every partition. But in general, we do not observe all of those breaks, and so we need to make some other argument in order to constrain the emitting region of the system. So in order to do the equipartition method, um, so this depends on the radius, but the biggest assumption that we need to make is that we're determining a radius, but that says nothing about the area or the volume of the emitting region. So we can, we can get the radius very well, but if that emitting region is a sphere or a cone, um, the volume and the area change significantly. And so when we're doing this kind of approach of constraining TDE outflows, um, we have to assume a geometry um, in order to calculate the energy and the radius, well, not the radius, the energy and, and those sorts of things from that radius that we derive. And so the biggest assumption is a geometry. Um, so what we tend to do is we actually will do this, these calculations, we'll get a radius and energy, velocity, those sorts of things for both a spherical outflow and a collimated outflow, and we'll just report all cases <laughs> because we're observers. We don't have to constrain things. Um, that's it's yeah. We can just kind of say it could be this, could be this, based on these assumptions, and that's what we do. So um, basically, just from observing a synchrotron spectrum like this one, we can constrain the radius, the energy, the velocity, the magnetic field strength, the ambient density. Um, using the assumption of equipartition um, and what we've observed for every TDE, provided that we have detailed radio spectra. And if we do this for multiple epochs, so if we're watching the spectrum go from this um, in one epoch to, oops, to this in another epoch, um, and we measure a different, so that's VSA1, this is VSA2, um, we can get a really good constraint on the velocity of the outflow um, and how that outflow might be decelerating or accelerating, but I don't think they're ever accelerating, they're usually decelerating, <laughs> um, through that central region of the galaxy. Um, yeah, and the, I think um, what's important is that if the break frequency is higher, it corresponds to a smaller radius, and if the break frequency is lower, it corresponds to a larger emitting region. So when we tend to see the spectra shifting to lower frequencies over time, that means that we're watching an emitting region grow, which makes sense logically from what we think are producing these things. Um, and also we can, from these constraints, we can get an estimate of the ambient density. So that is the density of the circumnuclear medium. However, we can only get a constraint on the ambient density if the thing that is producing the shock is that interaction between the outflow and the gas in the, in the second nuclear medium. If the thing that is producing the shock is actually internal shocks inside of a jet, it does not give us a constraint on the ambient density of second nuclear medium, it gives us a constraint on the density within the jet. <laughs> um, so there's kind of different assumptions that you can make to understand this system. And so if I assume that these are not jets, that it's an interaction between the outflow and the second nuclear medium, then we are constraining the central region of the galaxy. Um, so yeah, it's important to, to mention that it does depend on the assumptions that you make. So um, we can do this for many TDEs. So this is, um, again, my favorite TDE, AZH. <laughs> um, this is, we've done exactly this. I measured all of those spectra I showed you earlier today. We constrained, we estimated a radius, energy, velocity, mass in the emitting region, magnetic field strength. You can see the magnetic field is not well constrained. <laughs> Um, as neither is the second nuclear medium density. Um, and we do this for multiple epochs over years. And what you see is that the radius is growing. Um, the energy is also growing. Um, the velocity was maybe constant, maybe decelerating at later times. Um, kind of hard to say. And the two points, so the red and the black here, correspond to different assumed geometries. So the black points are if we assume that the emitting region is a sphere. <laughs> 
and the red points are if we assume that the emitting region is a collimated jet or if, well not a mildly collimated jet so like 30 degrees whereas relativistic jets are usually less than 10 degrees um, and so what, when, we, when we do this we can actually um, fit some kind of you can fit you know a line to the radius and you can track back with time to when the radius was zero and that gives us a constraint on when the outflow was launched um, and what for this event we found was that the outflow was launched coincident with the initial optical flare so it was la launched really early on um, and I don't see how you can drive a accretion induced wind or something for an outflow that was launched coincident with the initial optical rise of the event and so we don't just do this for one event, we do this for a population, ideally. Um, at the moment, we've probably done this for about six or seven TDEs. Um, and you can again see the, the VWL plot has four different lines, and that is basically um, based on different equipartition assumptions is the different colors. So you can kind of assume that maybe there's 10% of the energies in the electrons um, and five times 10 to the minus 4% of the um, energies in the magnetic field or you can assume slightly different numbers um, and you'll end up with different outflow constraints. So you can see it's, it's not uh, particularly constraining because it's very dependent on the assumptions that we make, um, but we do get general trends and order of magnitude estimates of what this emitting region looks like in the radio. And so if we do this for multiple events and put it all together, we can get an understanding of what the population looks like. Um, so the left plot here shows the kinetic energy in the outflow versus the velocity. Um, that dashed line is the cutoff between a relativistic and non-relativistic outflow. Um, so those are the two relativistic events and the, the others are all kind of the non-relativistic ones. Um, and they all kind of occupy similar area of parameter space, I guess. There are orders of magnitude different in the energy, but again, that just comes down to different system parameters. So um, it can depend on how the star was disrupted. If it's a particularly deep encounter, um, you might have a more energetic outflow. Um, if it's a particularly dense environment, again, you might get a more energetic outflow. So there are different things that can affect what we see. And on the right plot, this shows us probing the circumnuclear environment of distant galaxies. So if you know anything about galaxies, it's very difficult to see the central regions or even resolve individual stars. Um, but these radio observations enable us to put constraints on how the density drops off with radius as you go away from the black hole. Um, and you can see, again, they have slightly similar trends, um, but there is some difference in, in the density, um, um, how, it, how it drops off as you go away from the black hole. But in general, we're seeing that the, the velocity of these outflows from TDEs are about 10% the speed of light, so they're very much not relativistic. Um, they have energies on the order of 10 to the 48 to 10 to the 50 ergs and radii on the order of 10 to the 16 to 10 to the 17 centimetres. Um, so they start at about 10 to the 16 and as they grow, um, they'll go up to 10 to 17, even 10 to the 18 centimetres. And so if you compare this to where we're seeing the optical and x-ray emission, we're seeing most of the optical black body radii that people estimate from the, the optical light curves, they're like 10 to the 15 centimetres or 10 to the 14 centimetres. So the radio emission comes from much further out than where the optical or x-ray emission comes from in these systems. Um, but it kind of, yeah, is showing us a different angle of, of these events. So the question is, um, are these outflows being launched early, so prompt outflows, or are they being launched late, so delayed outflows? And so for many of these events, um, so for example, the, the one in red, that's AZH, um, we can track the radius back with time and we get that the outflow was launched at the time of the optical flare. So it was launched very early, probably by some kind of collision induced outflow or the unbound debris stream or something like that. Um, however, HYZ, the one in blue, this one that was really rapidly rising at very late times, about a thousand days post TDE, is not consistent with being launched at the time of the outflow. Um, so senders in et al 2020, three, I guess, 2022, can't remember. Um, she modeled the radio spectra of this event at late times and found that it was more consistent with the with a, um, outflow that was launched like 500 days post optical flare. So perhaps this is a jet that was produced by the black hole 
many hundreds of days after it accreted a bunch of material. So that is quite interesting. So yeah, this is a plot showing the radius with time for a bunch of TDEs. Um, the ones on the left are mostly consistent with being launched at t equals zero, whereas the one on the right, um, so this is HYZ, is more consistent, and this is a few other ones as well, um, more consistent with being launched hundreds of days after the initial optical flare. So this points towards um, there being differences in the radio outflows that we see. And again, we could see that initially when I showed you the light curve plot, they all had very different light curves. So they all behave very, very differently. Um, and so they're not just a uniform population. Um, it really depends on each specific event as to what it is going to look like. Okay, do we have any questions? How do you explain the diversity? Of, how do you explain this, basically? Like, is there a good theoretical model to say why uh, some events have early unfolds and some events have later unfolds? Yeah, so in my opinion, I actually think I think there are different physical mechanisms that produce outflows in TDEs. I think you do get outflows from debris streams colliding, but I think you also get outflows from accretion-induced winds, and I think you also get jets. And so depending on your viewing angle and the density of the environment and all sorts of things with the system, that combination of different outflows um, will look different for each event. So I think it's a very complicated picture, basically. I don't think it's a simple you know, we have a sphere of material moving outwards from this TDE. I think it's much more complicated than that. Um, and I think that is somewhat why the low light curves all look extremely different. Um, there are some people that claim that all TDEs produce relativistic jets, which I don't believe. <laughs> um, but, you know, only once 2% of them are on axes. Um, however, a lot of the TDEs that we have seen in the radio are not consistent with an off-axis relativistic jet at late times, which is when you would see the off-axis relativistic jet. Um, so I think some definitely do produce jets, um, but I don't think it's all of them, or perhaps they're not all visible, they're too faint at late times, or for whatever reason, we don't see them. Yeah. So we, we learned yesterday that there was this idea that viewing angle to determine whether you're seeing high energy Gamma rays, and if you're looking over the building, you also get the suit. Is there a relationship between the top visibility of, of both the radio and? Yeah, so this is something we're trying to do now because we finally have, I mean, before now, we haven't had enough radio TDEs to do this kind of analysis. Um, but what we're finding is that there is no correlation between X ray detections and radio emission, um, which you would think there would be in that scenario. Um, and there's not really any correlation between the optical um, temperature or black body radius or anything like that and the radio emission. So it's- Radio emission yeah. in principle it, from the jet could be propagated in lots of different places And if there's not, if radio can transmit through the medium better than, than the x-rays can, maybe that could explain that you can see I mean, yeah, but again, we only see radio emission from about half of the events. So, you know, if they were all producing jets and things that should produce x-rays, but they're being blocked, then we, we should see a more consistent behavior, but we don't. So at the moment, it's still low number statistics. So we need a bigger sample of radio detected TDEs, and that's what we're still trying to put in proposals to get. <laughs> and I think with LSSD detecting more TDEs, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get a bigger radio population of TDEs. Okay, so this is a little fun interlude. Um, well, I think it's fun. Um, radio emission is sometimes ambiguous. So I've, you know, gone through synchrotron emission. I've said that lots of different things produce synchrotron emission. Um, but number one is AGN. If you look at a radio image of the sky, the majority of the sources that you see in that image are AGN. So if I, any radio source that I see, um, you know, there's a pretty high chance that it's going to be an AGN. Um, and AGN can behave very strangely. And you know, if we're looking at TDEs, we're by definition selecting for the objects that are behaving strangely. Um, so how do we tell the difference between AGN and TDEs? And I mean, the short answer is that we, we don't. <laughs> um, 
But the other thing is also that, as I kind of, you would have seen in the tutorial, is that galaxies can also produce persistent radio emission. Um, they can produce this from star-forming regions in the galaxy. Um, they can also have low-luminosity low, low AGN in the centre that produces this kind of persistent radio emission. And so some of the synchrotron emission that we see, so for example for VWL, it really was not well fit until we subtracted off a host component and then we, sh we showed that we had a really nice synchrotron self-absorbed spectrum. Um, so we also have host emission to account for in these events. Um, now this is a paper I'm writing at the moment, um, so if you have any suggestions let me know. <laughs> Um, so this is a strange TDE-like event. Um, so this one is called AT2022 DSB, and its radio evolution is unlike other TDEs. Um, so on the left here is that light curve plot of all of the TDEs. DSB is the red. So you can see there was initially a fair bit of variability, and then it just kind of did nothing. It's kind of just stayed very constant for a while. Um, and on the right plot, on the bottom, is the optical light curve. So you can see there was this very clear optical flare um, and that's called, that started at the red line um, and on the top is the radio light curve at different frequencies and the most interesting thing is that there are radio detections of this galaxy before the supposed TDE occurred and those radio detections are much brighter than the emission that we saw after the supposed TDE. Um, so immediately that's a bit weird and interesting um, and I think this, this event fits more into the population of ambiguous nuclear transients than it does a TDE. I think it could be a TDE. I mean, Hubble looked at it. Um, Hubble has not looked at many TDEs. Um, and they claimed that it looked a lot like a TDE. Um, but it does show very strange behavior in the radio, including these, these on detections. So I propose that this could actually be a TDE in an AGN. <laughs> <laughs> Why not be both? <laughs> um, and so if you have, you know, some kind of low luminosity AGN emission, you have some kind of disk accretion occurring, you then get a TDE or, you know, increased accretion onto the black hole. Um, this can actually change the, the properties of the, um, the cloud of material around the AGN or the gas around the AGN in which we get most of the radio emission from. Um, and so if you have a change in the... Um, opacity or the absorption of that radio emitting region, it can change the flux and it can change the spectral shape. So it's kind of similar to a changing look AGN, I guess. So if we look at the radio spectra over time, again, you'll see these do not look like lovely peaked synchrotron spectra. <laughs> um, so this is very messy, um, but that dashed gray line shows what the host emission, you, okay, wait, I fit a line to two points, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, <laughs> but you, you can see that the host emission should look like, that's kind of what we think it looks like. And after the TDE, um, the host emission was higher at higher frequencies and lower at lower frequencies than before the TDE. And so this immediately points towards definitely a change in the synchrotron emission properties, a change in the absorption um, and in the opacity of the emitting region. Um, so if I subtract off the host emission, um, this is what the spectra look like, I have negative flux. <laughs> but <laughs> if you think of the negative flux as um, more of the host radio emission is being absorbed by an inhomogeneous cloud of material, perhaps from a TDE, um, and then over time after the TDE, that absorption of the cloud slowly um, goes lower, higher, whichever way, um, and it goes, returns back to the previous level it was that before was before the TDE. But the other interesting thing is that um, I've been looking at this source, we're now like, what, four, two, two years post TDE, and it still hasn't quite recovered to the previous level that it was before the TDE occurred, or whatever it was, if it wasn't a TDE. Um, so that could show that it doesn't quite recover to the previous level, because there's still a lot of material gas debris hanging around. Um, we can do some calculations about the absorption amount um, and we do actually infer a change in the opacity of um, the emitting region, which is interesting. But also, um, if we look at the excess emission at the high frequencies, um, that was kind of on top of what we expect the host to look like, um, it looks like this. And these do look like 
evolving synchrotron spectra, um, kind of. <laughs> um, so it kind of, the, the peak evolves to lower frequency over time. Um, and it kind of is, this model is this, this self-absorption synchrotron model. It's, it's not, I mean, it's not well fit, but it's not poorly fit by this model. And so what this would then indicate is that if this was a TDE, we're seeing a very low luminosity radio outflow from the TDE. And so this could indicate that all TDEs produce radio outflows. We're just not sensitive enough to detect them from most TDEs because they're all quite distant. And we wouldn't have detected this one if we weren't able to detect the change in the host emission. Um, so I think it's kind of a nice scenario, um, but I'm not convinced it is actually a TDE. And that's the issue with radio emission in general, and even just TDEs in general, is that they're extraordinarily difficult to classify. And an AGN can almost always explain what we see without requiring the destruction of a star. Um, does anyone have any questions about DSB? Yeah? A low luminosity AGN, probably. Yeah. Um, so this galaxy actually has an archival optical spectrum before the TDE occurred, and it has these really um, narrow emission lines, which are consistent with a type something ADN, a low, low luminosity ADN. Well, this, was it Rax? Yes. yes. Oh. Yeah. Um, wait, is this the only one that's like known? Oh. So that other really interesting thing, Assassin 14 LI is like the canonical non-relativistic outflow TDE, radio TDE. It was the first radio TDE that was observed and modelled to not be a relativistic jet. Um, it happened in 2014. But Assassin 14 LI actually has an archival radio detection. <laughs> um, so it's similar to this, except in that case, the host was um, a lot fainter than the transient emission. And so you ended up with an excess in the mission that evolved with synchrotron peaks over time. But like someone like Katie will say that Assassin 14 LI probably isn't even a TDE. <laughs> um, so again, yeah, there, Assassin 14 is the other really good case. And also Assassin 14 LI never quite recovered to its previous host level, similar to DSB after the TDE happened. Um, there, there, there are some strange events um, and it's very difficult to tell what's exactly going on. Um, also, how do you decide the first is a low luminosity AGN instead of starting Yeah, so I did that because I had some really high resolution VLA observations and the host is quite resolved and the radio resolution constrained the source size to be the center of the galaxy. So it wasn't coming from the outside edges. I have like a contour plot. Uh, it's not very interesting. It's just like a circle in the center. But then you can see the optical galaxy. The emission is not coming from the disk. It's coming from the, the nucleus in the radio. Okay. So that's the end of 